Hello YouTube world, this is Logic Crazy and I'm Jonathan and this is a tutorial on creating an advanced chess engine but in this tutorial we'll be focusing on bit boards which can also be applied to things such as checkers and pretty much any sort of uh, square board that's uh, within an 8x8 or 64 squares on the board. So it could be applied uh, not so well to things like Othello and such but uh, other games most definitely. So this is basically a bit board is a way of just uh, representing the board on a computer. Now you'll remember that uh, on our last simple uh, chess engine tutorials we represented the board by an array, an 8x8 array and uh, a, a, lowercase r, uh, a lowercase r would be a black rook and an uppercase r would be a white rook and a lowercase q would be a black queen and an uppercase uh, P would be a white pawn and so on, but bit boards are a much better way as far as they are much faster, more efficient, and you can perform certain calculations and searches much faster and efficiently. So let's take a look at all of these options. Uh, one thing about an array is it stores all the information about that board besides history or you know has the king ever moved and is castling possible and things like that but it stores the uh, where every piece is in one array however in bit boards we divide it into 12 boards and I'll explain why later but basically let's take a specific board let's say the black king board and we create a bit board that keeps track of where all the black kings are, if there are more than one, or whatever it is. So in this board, we basically represent it as a bit board would imply by the word bits in ones and zeros. So we take this grid and we fill it with ones and zeros. We place a one where that king was, right there, at E8, and the rest of them are zeros, meaning nothing is here. So this grid represents the occupancy of every square for, what, for black kings. And if you stretch this all out into, like I said, 8x8 eight eight makes 64 squ uh, squares, stretch it out into a 64-bit uh, integer, you get this string with that one near the left-hand side. So let's take another example here. Let's say we had our white Knights. Now, in this uh, example, we have two of them. And if we represent it by ones and zeros, you can see there are two ones at the bottom. And if we stretch this all out, and obviously when I'm stretching out, I'm doing as reading. So from left to right, from top to bottom, just as you would read. So we scan it so the ones should be near the end. And as you can see, the ones are right here near the end stretched out. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, a long because you need something to, rep to store 64 uh, bits and a bit is either a 1 or a 0, an on or an off. So uh, in an 8 bit, uh, I believe a, a char would be, uh, a character would be a eight, represented by 8 1s or zeros, and an integer would be 32 I believe in Java and a long is 64. So since we have 64 ones and zeros, we need a long. And uh, there's a few details about long in Java that we should notice. Uh, and basically, the definition of long, I'll only read part of it, is it is a data type, is a 64-bit signed twos complement in an integer. Now, what? does that all mean? We get 64 bits. That's how long it is and that's exactly how many uh, ones and zeros we need to represent. So that's all fine. But what's this sign twos complement? And we get the word integer, hopefully. And basically what that is, is binary only stores positive numbers. If you're familiar with binary, you can probably calculate what, how to represent 17 in an 8-bit uh, binary. Uh, number, 
However, how do you represent negative 8? That's a little more confusing, and that's where this whole two's complement and signed comes in. Uh, if it was unsigned, that would mean uh, there are no negatives. It's just a range of positive numbers, that can, any positive number that can be represented in 64 bits. But since it's signed, whoops, since it's signed, we need to figure out is it positive, is it negative, and how do we do that? And that's where two's complement comes in. Notice here, that means it, Java says it has a minimum value of this negative number and a maximum value of this positive number. You'll also notice that there's one difference between here. This one ends in an 8, this one ends in a 7, and that will all be uh, made clear shortly. So let's go on. Let's first convert integers into binary. This is a quick review. Hopefully, though, you have a bit of a basis in this sort of thing. So, 0 would be represented by all zeros. The rightmost column, the least significant column, would represent the 1s. The second column would represent the 2s, followed by the 4s, and followed by the 8s. Uh, that means this is a base of 2 in uh, in normal arithmetic that you would learn in school, things will have a base of 10. So this is the ones column, the tens column, the hundreds column, and the thousandths column. So when we do one, we have to put a one in the ones column. When we represent two, we put a one in the twos column. When we represent three, we put a one in the twos and a one. So this is kind of two plus one equals three. For our 4, we put 1 in the 4's column, and 5, 6, 7, and 8 is basically how we do this. Now, let's talk about how we do complements. Now, I know that the definition of Java is a 2's complement, but to understand 2's complement, first we have to take it one step at a time, starting with 1's complements. Basically, what we do, this is a way of representing negatives just like two's complements, we take the basic decimals, positive, and the binaries, and the one's complement is identical to the binary for positive numbers. But when it's negative, what you do is you take all the uh, ones and zeros of the binary and invert them, swapping ones and zeros. So instead of triple zero one, you would have triple one zero. And as you can see, right down to the last one, where you have 1 triple 0, you have 0 triple 1. So basically, you just invert them, and that's how we're going to represent uh, negatives. And this seems like a very simple method, but Java has chosen to go with something one step more complicated, and that is two's complements. So in two's complements, what we do is we have to invert it like one's complement, and then you add 1. So again, positives are the same as regular binary. But then for a negative, we would do it two steps at a time. We would first invert this. So we'd go triple one, zero. And then you add one, make it triple one, one. And that's four ones right there. And as you can see throughout the whole thing, what we are doing is uh, inverting and adding one. Uh, I believe this bottom one might be uh, a little off. But anyway, uh, that is basically how we do it. Um, so now I will uh, go on to explain a bit more about two's complements, first by taking a test. How would we figure out the difference between 4 and negative 4? And don't rewind the video to find out. Let's see if we can work this out on our own. So first of all, how would we represent 4 in binary? Well, it would be 0, 1, 0, 0. And in, I should go back, in larger bits, you tack on a bunch of extra zeros uh, on the left-hand side. Negative 4 in 1's complements would be the inverse, so it would be 1, 0, 1, 1, swapping 1's and zeros. And when you add 1, what you get is 1, 1, 0, 0, because of the way that whole thing works. Hopefully that makes sense. So that is basically how two complements work. Now, let's go on. If you don't understand this, uh, just rewind it and uh, 
see if you can go through the previous examples on that last page and just look at them. I may have made a few mistakes, but it should be pretty close. So why is two, why two's complements? I mean, one's complements was complicated enough. Why do we have to add one to the end? That doesn't seem like it makes sense. Obviously, normal binary has no way of representing negative, so it stands to reason that we can have uh, uh, that we need some way to represent negatives. Now, uh, obviously, in programs like uh, C and C++, there are ways to uh, have an unsigned number or signed, but unfortunately, we have to deal with signed integer longs in Java, so this is necessary to understand, but not so for uh, languages such as C. So, uh, there are other methods of representing binary negatives, including XSK and base2, but we won't get onto these less popular methods. But here's an example of why two's complements better. One's complements can represent zero as zero 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 or one 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 one. It's basically a difference between zero and negative zero. Uh, so there are two ways to represent a one digit. Whereas in two's complements, just by adding one to this whole thing, it turns it back into zero, 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 zero. So this is just one example of why two's complements are, uh, is a better method for Java to have chosen for a long. Now, as I mentioned before, you need 12 bit boards to represent any given chessboard, each one representing a different type of piece or a different color of the same piece. So there'll be six for white and six boards for black. And they will all be named accordingly. Instead of just having one array that's called chessboard, we're going to have one bit board that's called white knight, and one bit board that's called black rooks, and so on. Uh, if we had squeezed all 12 into the same board like this, as some of you might be wondering, what would happen if we turned this into binary? Well, we'd get a whole top two rows are all blacks and bottom two are all whites. And then so we'd have top two rows all ones and the bottom two rows all ones. But now we can't differentiate between which piece is which. We have flattened it so much that we only know that some piece exists at this square. And obviously chess needs a little more information just to, than just knowing a square is occupied or unoccupied. So that is a basic reason. Now why bitboards? Why not just stay with a simple array? I mean, I get that. Um, first of all, it's efficient on 64-bit 64, uh, 64 technology. Computers are designed in 64 bits uh, increasingly nowadays, and so it's very efficient. It takes very little space. An array uh, with different numbers in it takes many times more uh, bits than a single bit board. Um, even all 12 put together is still very efficient. And the second reason, a little more complicated, but it should make a whole lot of sense. Uh, first of all, uh, computers work with binary at the very lowest level, very efficiently and quickly, and a couple of things they can do with a binary number or binary anything is they can shift them, shift them and use arithmetic on these binary numbers. For instance, you can shift all the bits over. So we, if we take this uh, um, whole string of ones and zeros, we can shift it to the left, making it this, and tack on a zero at the end, or wrap that zero around. Or we can shift it to the right and shift all the ones over the other way. Now, this might not make sense of why it applies to chess, but just bear with me for a bit. So the first thing you can do is shift all the digits over. And it could shift them multiple times over in one direction. Another thing it can do is it can do binary mathematics. So for instance, if we had this number, whatever that is there, and if we add this to it, what do you get? Well, we add 0 and 1, and we get a 1 at the bottom. And a 1 and a one, 0 turns into a 1, and basically get this bottom thing. However, it didn't quite 
totally mathematically work because the top number is 38 and the bottom number represents 70, but it doesn't equal 102, which is the, what it claims to equal. And that's because 1 and 1 still produce a 1. Basically, true and true produces true, is how you could think of it. And so basically, uh, 6 basically is what 110 stands for. 6 have been lost. So because they uh, were duplicated. And so this answer should have been 108. But basically it tacks on all the ones at the bottom in that fashion. Now here's how it can be applied to chess. First of all, let's imagine this is the pawn structure for white. We're playing white facing black up here at the top. And here is where all our pawns are. Now, keep the positions in mind. Notice where can the pawns attack? Uh, so that would be all the squares up and to the right. So basically for this pawn here, in the middle of the board sort of, it can attack the one uh, to the upper right of it, as can all the others. This piece here can attack this one. So it can basically attack all of these squares. You can see how they got all just got shifted over. So how do we do this? What we do is we take this board representing ones at all these red squares and we shift it over. So we take this square here, for instance, and shift it over seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that's where it taps. And you take all the ones and shift them over seven. So basically this entire number, all you do is shift it as a whole over seven and that has shifted every single one over by 7, representing where everything attacks. So just by shifting 7 over, we have figured out every place to the right where a pawn can attack. Same with to the left. You can shift it over by 9 this time and find out, like this, you can see how it shifts over, all the other places where the pawns can attack. So if you overlap these, here's your pawn structure, here is shifting the entire pawn structure over by 7, and here is shifting it over by 8. And what we did was we added them together. We put them over top. So we figured out the board for the right and the board for the left, and we did an addition to get all of these blue squares together, representing every square where any pawn could attack. So we have very efficiently in two simple, three simple moves, shift over seven plus shift over nine, determine the square every single pawn attack location, um, no matter how many pawns there are. So I hope that this has been helpful. I hope this makes some sense. This has basically been a foundation for the way that bit boards work and the way that we will be structuring our chess engine. I will be explaining more stuff uh, that is Java specific in the next tutorial on exactly how you can program this in. And it should hopefully make a lot of sense to you as we uh, spend more time with bit boards. But I just want to provide that foundation so that uh, you are not uh, kept in the dark as to what this whole bit board thing is and how it works and why it's advantageous and so on. So I hope this has been helpful and until next time, enjoy chess.